So we are back again, back to the future. Um, I've connected it a bit in advance because I think uh, why wait two more minutes where we have the pleasure to talk to Mark instead? I think it makes we, more we sense. Two minutes to talk about <laughs> my favorite single malt scotch. Oh, uh, I'd love to. Really? <laughs> I'd love to, but it's, yeah, but the, it's if you want. Of Ardbeg. That's uh, we probably don't have licensing to. No, they, it's a free sales for them, isn't it? They won't object to that. I don't think they care. I think they'll be fine. With that. <laughs> so I, yeah, I'm on my computer, and Leandro is still on his computer. So I should be ready for you when you're ready. Okay. So uh, let me introduce briefly. I mean, do I need to introduce Mark Thompson? I don't That's know. The question. I don't, not, not no. many people know me. You know. Uh, so, yeah, first, web performance. So, I think um, today uh, we talked about user experience a little times, uh, browser based testing. Uh, Federico Toledo mentioned about it. Yes, it's great. Test earlier, continuous testing, just the uh, uh, integration testing or assembly staging testing or whatever, end to end testing. But um, make sure that. Uh, <laughs> You're gentle with you, your users. Um, a lot of things now is happening on, on the on the browser level, so uh, uh, that it's it's very important to make sure that the JavaScript is not uh, taking forever. Um, there is a quote from Steve Sanders, uh, one of the guru on the web performance world, saying that uh, I'm, I guess once the system has been optimized on the backend side. It says that mo your, most of the customers are spending 80% on the browser. So the time that you have in terms of response times is mainly at the browser level. So um, I may think is right, but uh, if the, the back end is poor, I'm pretty sure that uh, you're spending also a lot of time on the, on the, on the back end. But uh, still, we need to test it. Uh, lots of performance engineers is not super uh, aware or not, not delivering much Web performance usually it's like more like a web developer task, but I think we we need to also add that that part. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm pretty interesting that uh, you share that uh, for for the for our community. Otherwise, Mark Clemson. So Mark Clemson, he is the yeah. uh, the, the uh, producer, the founder, the whatever from Perfbyte. So uh, you go to perfbyte.com. Uh, there's a podcast, it's available in iTunes, it's available in uh, uh, Testlog, no? I don't know, where's the, the other platform? It's, it's, it's on Spotify and Google okay. and Stitcher and Overcast and TuneIn. Overcast. And, yeah, it just goes on and on and on. And also, recently I discovered that you're, pushing, you're uh, sending nice uh, uh, things on SoundCloud. So, uh, the last, uh, yeah, the last you know, what's, what's funny, Henry, most people don't understand that all of the funny kind of blooper weird things end up on the Perkbyte SoundCloud. Hmm. Okay. So if you, the weird, weird blooper things, like like the uh, the the jackalope, the ride in jackalope. And there's a, uh, yeah. a special holiday New Year's greeting from Satan himself. No way. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. And it's like a Satan old Lang Syne. Oh okay. So it, was it was it was it done before uh, before um, uh, News Under the Dam or was it done after? No. Well, I I, I, w I wasn't personally introduced to Satan until James did the News of the Dam. So I, I think uh, he I think he he found us uh, in the in the greater scheme of things. He was like, hey, wait a minute. You know, speaking of damned IT people, <laughs> we gotta. <laughs> I'm gonna have reach out to those guys. So yeah, we've had a pretty good joint venture partnership over the years. Uh, but uh, little did we know, uh, Bills above Lucifer, the Prince of Darkness, was totally into podcasting. I think we need to have a session. Let's say uh, in uh, in the life of Bob, in the shoes <laughs> of Bob. It will be pretty cool. Saying, oh, every performance is yeah. nice with me. It's cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, Otherwise, uh, uh, Mark Thompson, when I uh, uh, when I uh, start to follow Mark, Mark was working for 
a company that was delivering software and load testing software. So it's, it's HP. And also you order as well for Microsoft. And I think, I don't remember, but I don't know if you made some a uh, uh, few months in Shunra as well, did you? Yeah, so I, I did Shunra for a little while, but of course I I had used been a Shunra person for like 10, 12 years as a using Shunra and Loadrunner. But there was Mercury before that, did my work at PayPal. Uh, but of course HP is not even HP anymore. It's now MicroFocus. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's true. So he's been in the industry some, since a while. I mean, not, not a while, but uh, if you've been following uh, load testing, I guess you have heard uh, Mr. Tomlinson. And um, and also, it's, uh, it's always great to listen to the podcast. And usually, I, I'm always having fun to uh, when, when, when we do a podcast. Yeah, and every, every now and then, we have you on to talk about things, yeah. which is kind of cool. Yeah, cool. And it's your second virtual pack. Last time you did, uh, we, we were, I was, uh, I don't remember uh, when I looked at the agenda. Wow, Mark joined us at the beginning of the USO. So basically, you did almost uh, yeah. six hours with us. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. We, mostly I wasn't traveling. And of course, today we were doing the conference here and another thing. So we were both kind of stuck behind the, behind the desk. But, and this is awesome. And, and how are you feeling? This is, this is for 24 hours. You were almost gotten through it. Are you doing all right? Uh, so now, officially, I'm awake since 24 hours. Okay, good. There, so there you I go. I think I left, no, I left you on a hallucinating uh, blue hair guy. Yeah, you haven't. <laughs> I actually, the, it's not, you're not hallucinating anything. It's actually <laughs> blue purple. I think I'm talking to Sam. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, 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 you need to come to our pack. So, Mark. Is here if you're not at the, our business physical pack. Uh, I hope that Leandro can, can join as well. We, he, I, we I think fine. Leandro, he'll twist my arm, or we could just do a pack in Philadelphia. Yeah, never been there's to Philadelphia. An, there's a crazy and idea, I, and then then I can uh, put uh, some barbecue ribs on the uh, smoker. Uh, you know what? I just purchased a barbecue a smoker. Recently. Okay, well that's a that's a I whole other to... presentation. We can all <laughs> so so we need we need to do a barbecue session and discuss all our right. barbecue. Right? No. All, all right. right, so uh, I'll uh, leave you share. I uh, let you share the screen and uh, I let you present. I will be quiet and gentle and let you present everything. Well, that's, that's very touching, and I'm I'm a little concerned. Okay, so you you just put Leandro on. You did switch from Leandro to me. Oh, oh sorry. He's he's a perfectly nice guy, and he's sitting like I'm, right in front of me. I'm mute. I know. I yeah, know. you're muted now. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can be muted. You can be muted there. Um, yeah, is that all right, Henrik? Is that going to work out all right? Are you got to promote me or something? No, uh, no. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, you just have to um, uh, click on the on the right side of Blue Jeans. There is a button share uh, share options, content share options. I think content sharing options, and then in that menu you have share screen. Okay, so I get rid of that. And it's on the right side. There's moderator chat, polls, Q and A. That's all I got. Event chat, participant roster. Have the, the yeah, you need words. you need to make me a presenter. No, no, you're already a presenter. You, you should, because you're connected as a presenter, so you should have the option. Okay, I don't see it. It's on the right side. I don't have the same UI as as you have because I am a moderator. It's not under chat. Participants, presenters, there's four presenters. No, you don't have the option. It's in, it I should be hear. like this guy, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, Henrik, you're, it says, Henrik, you're still sharing your screen. Uh, I'm not. Oh. No, but that's not it. I have the option, but I don't see it on yours, regardless of Henrik's. Yeah. Should I uh, refresh my screen here? I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Or I'll just switch places with Leandro. 
Yeah, or otherwise you can take a, try to behave like Alejandro. Oh, my God, you got it. Hey, hey. That's yeah, Leandro's screen. Yeah, that's Leandro. Do you want to fire up my presentation? All right, we're going to switch. You get the nice headphones. You don't mind that. White mouse? That's what you really need. Yeah, I need to mute you here. I already muted him. It's done. Mute that guy. Uh, I think it's muted here. No, no, no. Here. We got we to gotta do this. Hmm. Right with you in a second there. Da, da, da. You're in blue jeans. One second, Henrik. You can use the white mouse. I got it. Da, da. Uh, all right. What are you seeing? Is that better? Way better. I see Way the better. browser. You see the browser. Now you see my presentation. I think it's yeah. a lag box. Is it lagging now? I still yeah. see PowerPoint. Yeah. No, I still, still see PowerPoint. You have launched the slideshow already? Ah, it's coming. Perfect. You good? Rock and roll? Yeah. yeah. That's cool. You can go. What do you see? I see. I see. Uh, I see your the first slide. Okay. So you it does it look right slide wise? Ah. I don't see your slide. Yeah, that's kind of strange. So I think I, I, we, I see the slides. Uh, I think, uh, let me check on the, Stefan's uh, laptop for two seconds. Okay, let's just make sure you guys got oh. it. Yeah. So it just took a while for, uh, for Leandro's, uh, stuff to go. Um, and Henrik, I'll, I'll wait for a second if you need to confirm that. I know you're recording this. Recording is good. I like recording. Uh, let's see. What do I want to see? Yes. Before? Yes, we can see the slides. In the Looking good. Here. And uh, of course, uh, uh, instead of the bat symbol uh, that I took from Leandro's presentation opening, it's a I did senor symbol. Senor, senor bat symbol. La senor señal. Los un uh, un poquito vampiros. <laughs> yeah, the little bats. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. My Spanish is not bad. That's good. But we're Leandro and I are both working on our German. Um, so ganz gut. Um, the uh, so before I get started, Leandro uh, was part of my web performance workshop yesterday, mm. and um, he admitted, uh, which I think was a very, it took a lot of strength for him to admit that uh, it's very true that he's just been a server network storage load testing kind of guy, and the browser was sort of a redheaded stepchild that he would like to ignore and, um, you know, was never, never really cared never about. Allowed. No, not even, yeah, exactly. But through the wonderment of uh, tutelage in a three-hour web performance workshop, he's gained a whole new appreciation. Uh, and hopefully this presentation, in addition to the web performance workshop that he took yesterday, he will become a web performance guru. Um, and to, um, to Henrik's opening uh, introduction, thank you very much, Henrik. And I appreciate 23 hours into not, no sleep. That is... Uh, the best introduction I've ever heard uh, anyone give me. Um, but I will say the Steve Souders quote, uh, where 80% of the performance issues are on the front end, meaning the client, the browser, is really a quote, if we put it in context in time, it's almost 10 years ago. So it's around 2005 where he was doing work, uh, I think that's right, and you can quote me if I'm wrong, he was around, in Yahoo, at least by 2008 or so, things were really taking off for web performance and why slow was being built. So it's, if, if we just take it on the average, it's been at least between eight to 10 years, uh, or maybe more than 10 years uh, of web performance work, where I, 
think we did a great job for 25 years optimizing the back end. And yes, so only 20% of our performance problems were on the back end because Load Runner and every other tool like it, uh, way back into the 90s, uh, we did a really good job with the most concurrent parts of the system, which were networks, servers, and storage, uh, and data. And so that was really going really fast, but we invented this cool thing called the browser, and it keeps getting fatter and fatter and fatter. And it has all these weird esoteric rules around rendering and sequence and all this stuff. And we just weren't giving enough attention. So even Leandro to this day, uh, or hopefully anyone that's uh, that's watching this presentation now, we can get wake up a little bit. We can I denied wake, that time. Yeah, we can wake up a little bit to, hey, you know, these the browser is much faster now than it was even five to 10 years ago. Uh, and if you think about Scott Moore's presentation on HTTP3, and of course, I learned a lot uh, from Scott around HTTP2 when he was really focused on that. There are tremendous things between HTML5, HTTP2, and HTTP3 that make a lot of the, the rules that I'm going to review with you today, uh, I don't want to say obsolete or meaningless, but it, they solve a lot of problems at the protocol level that make this a much easier to do. A little bit about myself. Um, I've currently coined myself the performance Sherpa. Um, it just got too technical for me from a medical perspective to refer to myself as the performacologist. Uh, I found that a lot of people were medically scared uh, from the room that I there was going to be some sort of an invasive procedure done, uh, and that's just not true. Um, I have been doing performance things in one way, shape, or another for nearly 27 years. Uh, as uh, Heinrich point Hendrik pointed out, uh, worked for Microsoft and HP, Mercury. Uh, PayPal uh, and a bunch of other little companies as an independent person. Uh, I'm the one of the co-founders with my friend James Pulley uh, on the Perfbytes podcast and the Perfbytes family of stuff, uh, and also the STP Radio uh, podcast, which we do, and we're here at the STP Con in Boston, looking out at the Boston Airport right now, which is nice. Um, I do a lot of different talks and teaching on performance. I do uh, quite a bit of mentoring and coaching of individuals around the world. Uh, who are all at different levels uh, of their expertise and journey in learning performance. I currently spend most of my time local in Philadelphia, which is why we should have a pack uh, or a whopper and a pack or a whopper and a pack and and, and a barbecue, and barbecue in Philadelphia, uh, a Perf Bites rendezvous. In, uh, in there you go. Yeah, that would be good. Let me we'll work that in 2020. That would be kind of fun. Um, and today, uh, I want to talk about this crazy guy named Steve Souter. Uh, and Steve, uh, who's a person I've never met, and there's a lot of, oddly, there's a lot of people in the performance space from load testing uh, and uh, performance, traditional performance testing who haven't surfed in the circles uh, in, ter in terms of community or conferences or even in terms of authoring books, which Steve has done. Um, he was working uh, back in the day in um, Yahoo, I believe it was, and they invented, went on to invent uh, the popular tool Wiseflow. But he came up with these great rules, sort of codifying, uh, or I'd say codifying in English, uh, the web performance websites, high performance websites. Uh, and it was really kind of the birthplace of this uh, short hashtag called WebPerf, uh, which really focused on browser performance, which was great. Um, and that was such a hit to do one book with O'Reilly that they were like, hey, let's, let's do another book. There's so much more here that we have never thought about. So you get even faster websites. Um, so if you, for whatever reason, let's say you get interrupted because you need to get a sandwich or your manager comes over and taps you on the shoulder and you have to go do something. If you do nothing more uh, in this presentation and listening to this talk, you can still go out and get these two websites and they're still relevant. And there's a bunch of newer uh, publications as well that we can talk about at the very end. Uh, but these were the two books that kind of started it all. And it evolved from the first, let's say eight to 10 rules into a full 16. Uh, and this is just one of the various, uh, there's lots of websites out there. I put a few of the links out there. Um, one of the sites uh, that I grabbed did a pretty comprehensive listing of 16 different guidelines for web performance. And most of them I could break down into one of two areas primarily. The main area would be starting with rules that focus, like Steve did, on the browser, the actual performance on the client computer uh, as it's rendering. Uh, a web page and having to go from HTML, we'll talk a bit about that. But then there's several of these that have more systemic 
uh, or totally systemic, end-to-end, -end, including web servers, database servers, networks, CDNs, app servers, messaging, uh, other data stores, third-party apps, the entire architecture of the back end of the system um, that, that back then Steve was claiming, hey, only 20% of your performance of problems are there. Uh, and we'll, I want to go through uh, kind of a rundown of almost all 16 of these uh, as fast as I can get through it, um, but also talk about the systemic implications, like what is going on behind the scenes for these optimizations uh, as you see them. Because a lot of the, lot of the websites out there will just say, hey, you should make fewer HTTP requests because that's a good thing. And the rationale is, well, wh why is that a good thing? Tell, tell me, Mark. Tell me, Mark, why is that a good thing? And that's what Leandro just looked at me. Um, what I will tell you is that there is one main theme through all of the literature on web performance, and that is the following phrase. And maybe there's like some angelic music in the back. I can do, I can do the... Yes. Thou shalt not block thy DOM. And the DOM uh, in the browser is the document object model. So if any of you are functional testers that work within functional tools for, uh, let's say, identification of tags within a browser rendering or actually referring and scripting within the browser, you're familiar with the DOM. Um, and that is the primary thing. So in any one shape or form, all of these rules talk about some esoteric thing in a browser architecture, and they're slightly varied from one browser to the next. Um, and from a web per perspective, that will, what's called blocking the DOM. So in the database world, blocking would be, uh, I would like to access record number 10, but Leandro's session is doing an update on record number 10. So he takes a row level locking on it and I'm blocked from actually getting to that. So in the database, there's this idea of locking and blocking. The same thing happens on a client. And that's the, the real learning here is that each of these rules inside a browser, it's kind of like a whole little computer system, right? It, there's a network adapter inside the browser, inside your computer. So the process that runs the browser has network processing. It has a graphical engine that does graphical rendering, which is sort of like the presentation layer being sent, but it's all running in the browser. So each of those things have to cooperate within the Chrome or Firefox or Edge or uh, Internet Explorer, if you still have it, um, Safari, I guess. Any of those browser architectures are almost like several different components within that architecture. And any if you get one of those rules or sequences wrong, it will block rendering the DOM. So let's jump into one of the first ones, um, which we talk a lot about. Uh, which is caching. And the first kind of caching, if you're looking at the browser, is the local browser caching. So how many of you have had a web app that didn't work? Or, oh, I'm having a hard time logging in, or how come this thing isn't working? And if you ever called support uh, for your browser computer, or maybe you're, uh, maybe a relative of yours who's not in IT, what should I do? Well, did you clear the browser cache? And that's like going into the browser options and saying, good, clear the, and that's the local file system on your computer on the client, clearing out all the cached objects. Um, a good example of that is the cookies. So that's why there's pictures of cookies there. It's not just to entice you. You'll find all my images are, are either completely irrelevant or just humorous. Um, so I just, I like cookies, so it's good. Um, but obviously, if you can load a web page uh, and you get like six images and two JavaScripts and a CSS, and you can store those images locally uh, in what's called using a web storage API, so it mean would sit on the actual desktop itself, the web storage within Chrome or IE. Uh, there's one called the index DB. There's another AB API for storing data. So you can actually put that in a different API in most of the browsers. There's a new one coming out in the newer browser. It's called the cache API. It's a special API specifically for managing cache according to that new specs for HTTP 2 and 3, which is cool. Um, but the idea is, hey, the next time I refresh and visit that website, it loads a thousand times faster because I can get that data locally. I don't have to go connecting to a web server or connecting to some remote location to get that resource, be it a JavaScript or CSS or image. But the gotchas, here's the thing, if we really think about that, my browser process wakes up and I hit F5, and what it's gonna do, it's still gonna probably parse the HTML and the HTML gets parsed into tags and tokens, 
uh, those tokens turn into the DOM, so I'm rendering a DOM, and if I hit a CSS, I'm gonna have a CSS object model, and so if the CSS object model loads, and then it says, all right, now I'm going through those tags, I see one, here's a picture, here's an image, and I have to load that image. Well, here's two things that are one. One, if you have some sort of, uh, a, what's an exp called an expires header that's very far in the future, um, that means put this image of a cookie, or put an actual cookie, put an image of a cookie uh, on the client browser and leave it there for the next year. But be, I would be concerned if, let's say, a JavaScript or a CSS or some kind of script gets pushed down to the client, it's cached locally, but then the functionality changes, or the, let's say the branding, the logo color changes for the image you have on a logo. But the next time someone visits the website, that logo hasn't changed. And different web architectures, different web servers may or may not send the proper headers to refresh that local cache. Um, so people might be loading old versions of the website, um, and, uh, and so your the functionality could break, or the image and branding could look different if you've got old image and static content cached locally in the browser. So you got to think a little bit: How are you going to do that? Can you? Uh, there are some functions you can use with the new APIs in the cache API. You'll be able to clear the cache with script, and which is pretty cool. Um, there's ways to manage that within the app. Um, the other thing I'll say is, obviously, there's a limit on limit on storage space. So if you if you have an old computer, and some some companies they let the computers get pretty old. Um, if they don't have a lot of money, or let's say they're a nonprofit, you'll find some really old Windows 7 machines because we loved Windows 7. We don't get into that. Uh, so limits on on storage space and also speed. So if you've ever gone into some places with an end user who's not a technology geek, and they open up like 20, 30. 40, 50 different tabs on the same browser, and they're different processes, but all of them share a local storage. Now you've got like 40 or 50 different tabs that might have background refreshing happening. You can actually, if you have an old spindle-based disk, especially on like a 5400 RPM old laptop drive, you could end up with like local storage constraints in terms of speed to get to local resources. So it may sound crazy, to a performance tester, when we test, we have one tab, we load the app, hey, it's great, take your measurement. In the real user, your real in the real world, your real users may have 40 different tabs open bouncing between accounts or who knows what. So keep an eye on the limit on the quantity of storage space and the local speed of that disk to see if that's actually going to be the real context for performance. And so that's the first one is uh, the, one of the things just if you can load resources locally, totally load them locally. Um, one of the next rules, putting CSS and JavaScript at the right place within the page. Now, the, at, the first thing you might say is uh, put your CSS at the top of the page. That's the first rule you're going to see. Um, if you put the CSS at the bottom of the page, that means it will parse the HTML into tokens and go all the way down and create the DOM. And then the DOM starts to be there, and it's like, well, wait a minute. I noticed one of the tags is a CSS and I haven't gotten to the closing HTML tag, so I'm not gonna render the DOM, but oops, there's a CSS, and I need to render now the CSS object model. So we have the document object model, the DOM, and the CSS object model, the CSSOM, which gets created, I'd say, before the DOM renders the page, but it's com immediately at the end of the CSS. So if you've ever gone to a website where you hit the refresh page and it seems like it takes forever, and then Blink, it like loads everything on the page, appears instantly. So it looks like you're waiting on network resources, but actually it's downloaded everything and it's waiting for CSS from the bottom footer to render, and then it draws the whole page. So you're sitting and waiting at a blank page or the what I call the white screen of death uh, in a blank HTTP. So that's, that's one of the good uh, replacements you can do there. Um, the other thing is putting the JavaScript at the bottom of the page not at the top of the page, so you do the opposite. Put your CSS at the top with the JavaScript at the bottom, partially because as the browser is processing the tokens from the HTML, if it hits a script tag, a script token, it's like, hold everything. This script could be doing all sorts of stuff. It could even, I have to download it and execute it, and it will actually stop rendering the DOM. And remember our rule, thou shall not block the DOM. Um, so scripts, to be honest, scripts for the most part 
um, are used to manipulate the DOM after it's been loaded, or even do interactive dynamic CSS. So you could actually be rendering a style uh, on top of the DOM uh, using JavaScript or types of script. So you really want the page to be active before you do stuff with, the, with JavaScript. Now there could be other functionality that sort of loads on top of that, that maybe downloads other HTML and other pages um, like a funky object is the iframe, and if you look at the history of the iframe and how that works, it's kind of interesting. Um, but the way it loads other HTML into sort of a browser and a browser thing. But the idea that loading a script resource is blocking the HTML and CSS, that's why you put the JavaScript at the very bottom, so you can actually load, 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 load all your stuff. And to be honest with you, um, we'll talk a little bit more about async uh, loading of scripts. Uh, which is really good. The other thing is to generally avoid embedded script or CSS um, in the page itself, just for portability. Um, there's not really a performance reason one way or another, but generally avoiding embedded script uh, because of the where the threads get used to run that. So if you hit a script script token and you uh, you expand that script token and download it and execute the JavaScript, it gets loaded in, and run in a different thread space. Uh, in some of the browsers. It's a slightly different uh, performance with the other threading to do that, which is cool. Um, so generally, again, put your CSS at the top, JavaScript at the bottom. This is about client performance in the fastest speed, the smoothest speed to get a page to render uh, and have present the functionality as fast as possible. So I mentioned async JavaScript loading. Well, that sounds really cool. I like asynchronous stuff. And scripts have script tags of any kind, whether it's JavaScript or you know other stuff. You can load the script, and you could load the JavaScript locally from cache or remotely, download it from a CDN or from a from a remote server. And then, of course, the second step is execute that script. JavaScript is an executable programming language. Um, some people don't like it. Some people love it. Some people don't care. Um, with async, in older browsers or older languages, I think even back to HTTP 1.0, it was called a defer. Um, as, a, as an attribute that you could put or an instruction on it, you would uh, the script download would not block the HTML. And that's an advantage. So let's say you're going to render a page that has uh, product details and it's got a product image and it's got you know specs, you know sizing, you know you know, select the options, color, and then you've got a buy button. And the first thing you really want people to see is the product image because wow, we really want to see what that headphones look like. And then maybe the second thing you want to have rendered is the buy button. So I see my headphones and I hit the buy button. Those are the two things I want to happen. If I can get those two functions, loading an image and loading a button to happen without any scripts, no JavaScript whatsoever, that's the fastest way to get my customer to convert. If that functionality is like rich and sexy Ajax coolness, and I need my JavaScript to download and execute and give all these function capabilities, um, then I, I have to have my JavaScript synchronously there before anyone can hit the buy button. So if you make JavaScript asynchronous, one of the gotchas here, if that script is required for functionality of the page, make sure that that functionality, you probably have to go synchronous. You don't want to make it asynchronous because you're sitting there at this beautiful looking page but none of the buttons work, none of the menus work. And so think about if I, if I load that JavaScript asynchronously, uh, does it show up, um, does it uh, impugn the functionality in order to use the page? So that's one thing. The other thing to think about uh, is if that JavaScript let, makes like an H, XHTML request, if it makes another web service request to download some JSON, a data array, or do other work, uh, do I need that for functionality? And is that JavaScript going to make remote calls that I have to wait for? And then am I going to re-render the DOM? If you've ever loaded a page and then something happens in the background and suddenly it blanks the page and loads again in front of you, that's a scripting error where somebody made something potentially asynchronous. And then when finally, oh, I downloaded a whole other CSS and I need to re-render that, there's some really funky things that can happen with the active scripting to do that. Um, also, of course, making remote calls is another round trip off the browser into the system. So that's kind of that's kind of tough. Um, there's this really cool thing that happens uh, called prefetch and reconnect, which is basically the idea that if I load a page that has three links on it, and the three links are go to the products page, go to my account page, and go to the profile page. Um, if 
on when I load my home page, I know that there are three next steps that I can take. I will preload, I'll parse that link. Behind the scenes, I'll fire up a separate thread and might even fire up a whole separate browser sort of hidden and start downloading that next page just in case you click on the product page or the account page. It runs in the background and then if a user clicks on the link, it's like, wow, to me, that was really fast. Wow, I right, boom, took me right to my account page. Wow, that's amazing. And it's a combination of local browser cache, but also prefetching and then reconnecting uh, to that next session. So it's sort of like looking ahead or reading ahead uh, in, the, um, in, in, the, in the way that it's just done. So the three main kinds of, of prefetches, one, you can just parse for links within the page and then prefetch those links. You can look for DNS prefetching. So if you've got different domain names within the links, you could say, okay, well, I'm gonna go get the IP addresses I'm going to skip the DNS lookup. So I'm going to not wait for DNS round trip. I'll go, hey, there's a whole bunch of these five different domain names. Let me go prefetch the IP addresses for DNS. And then there's actually pre-rendering. So you may figure out, I know what the form factor is. I'm actually going to do some work within the CSS to figure out exactly what size the images should be and get them all set up and get those things staged before I go to the next thing. Um, of course, um, watch out. Um, Band, anyone have any bandwidth limitations? What if you're on a mobile device, a mobile tablet doing this stuff? And you're like, all right, I downloaded page one and I noticed that there's all this network activity going on behind the scene. My page, I'm, I'm not clicking anything. I'm just sitting on my main page. I'm already here, but prefetch is running in the background. So you wanna keep an eye out for really busy pages that could do lots of prefetching. So this is not something that you wanna use all the time because it could chew up more network bandwidth on the back end and generate load even though people never go to those other pages. Uh, so just keep an eye out for sort of the background bandwidth uh, usage. And of course, if you're doing full on pre-rendering, not just prefetching, pre-rendering could even be chewing the CPU and memory uh, on the client uh, to do that. Um, the next one I wanna talk about images. Images, images, images. How many, do you have an old Polaroid? That's an old Instasnap Polaroid. <laughs> yeah. um, the two things I will say are good and bad. Uh, the mostly bad, and I won't say they're really bad, are what you'd call a roster image, a PNG, a JPEG, a GIF, a TIFF, these kinds of stuff. And they're pretty much made of pixels in a grid. So upper left to lower right, click, 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 a whole array of little squares, itty bitty little square pixels. Uh, and they're non-responsive, meaning the image itself uh, is does not re-render it just zooms in or zooms out according to the visualization within the browser functionality. So if you ever zoom in on a lower resolution JPEG, you'll see it gets kind of fuzzy. You know, just like when you zoom in too close on something, you'll see the pixels themselves. So the larger images, like if you want to have someone allow them to zoom in, those larger images mean you've just got to load more pixels. And of course, you can't, you can use compression. We'll talk about compression and stuff, but vector graphics in the browser um, they're not as responsive, so you can't resize the browser or have the same web page that works on a mobile device and a small screen and a big screen and and all and a tablet and all these different stuff. Um, so coming to our to save the day is what's called a scalar vector graphics. And scalar vector graphics with responsive web design are really, really good. So they have a really small source size usually. Um, the more complex scalar vector kind of stuff can get big. Um, but they're very responsive, meaning they're not dependent on the number of pixels. They're actually, uh, they resize and re-render themselves as you responsively scale them up. Um, so depending on the information that's allowed there, if it's very simple, it'll just re-render you know, a straight line or a, or a rectangle. It's very good for fairly simplistic images, uh, not so much for the full-on, um, uh, sort of full-on really detailed photograph stuff. So you might not see this for art websites or other kinds of things like that. Um, there's fairly minimal, at this point, there's fairly minimal CPU, but even on a mobile device, I might be concerned about CPU and, and battery. So minimal CPU to dynamically resize that. Uh, and then the alternatives that you would look at for roster images would be this thing called a source set or a picture tag. That's where you have maybe three or four versions of an image and you scale them up Here's the 2x, 3x, 4x type size images. But you have to, that's, that's downloading all the different image types depending on how you size the browser. 
Um, so if you can go to an SVG, scalar vector graphics, um, that's a really, really good choice uh, for, uh, for browser images. Um, the last thing from a client perspective uh, to think about is fonts. And a lot of us don't think about fonts. Uh, true type fonts, um, there's a bunch of other types of fonts that go out there for main fonts. Um, but a Unicode font can have like thousands of different glyphs uh, and character pieces in there. Um, and of course, the font formats, some of them require some kind of compression. So you're going to chew a little bit of CPU uh, to compress and decompress fonts the way you receive them. Um, if you're going to optimize them, keep in mind, if you start putting things into individual fonts, they're, ind they're independent resources. So if I have 16 fonts on a web page, that's if I don't have them locally, I need to go load those font files on 16 round trips to a server somewhere. It could be a CDN, but maybe it's a web server. And so those are round trips. You know, we don't want to make that many requests. So let's reduce the number of requests. Um, some of the fonts, when it comes for a DOM to actually render text visually, uh, it can sort of quote unquote block the text rendering, meaning it'll, it take this more complex fonts will do that. Uh, I, I don't know specifically which ones, but that's one to look out for. If you see the page started rendering, but the text seems to render really slow. Um, and then the other thing is to think about uh, the use of uh, font families, which is actually a directive within uh, within the HTML code itself or in the CSS, font families will allow you to tell the browser, use the local version of a font versus the URL directive, which is the remote version of the font. So you have to decide in the design of the web page, hey, do I just want to use any old Arial font on your computer, which might be slightly different on a Mac from a, from a Windows, uh, but just use the local version because I just need this to be fast. I don't really care what font, but it's in the Arial family. Have a nice day. But if I have a special font that I absolutely want to get from my web server because it's a very unique artistic website, you might use a URL directive, but keep in mind, URL directives are going to be remote. So you've got to make a remote call to do that, and that takes time. Um, font families, if you have several fonts on a page, Splitting them up into separate front font families also allows you to use them on demand separately. Instead of loading all the fonts at once, you might use just one or two of them. Uh, if you never even render the text for the last 10 fonts, you'll, then you'll never get them. So look at the font family tag to do that. Um, now let's talk about the system, like other web optimization rules that talk about the back end. Um, and these will go pretty quick. Um, the first one seems like a no-brainer to me. So you guys tell me, um, like if I'm if I have somebody that's like, hey, we're doing, we're, the business process takes 40 different hits to the website, and wow, that's a lot of load. Well, can you guys do the same business process with 20 hits to the website? Okay. Well, that's good because then we cut the load in half and we do the same business process. Um, so I'm, I'm used to that from like a database perspective. Hey, how come you guys are calling like 16 different queries? Can you put 15 of them behind a single stored procedure call? And then I use one connection in the connection pool, get the stored procedure done. And I have these less round trips between the web server and the database server. Well, the same thing happens in the browser, right? So a browser is like a web server talking to a web server, which is like a database server because the web code and the web static content is on the server side. The browser is the client side. So each remote resource obviously requires a round trip, and that's a send and receive. That's HTTP over HTTP over TCP. So send, receive, send, receive. You're always going to have some kind of network latency to do that. And hopefully it's fast, meaning local networks less than a millisecond. Um, or if you're going over mobile networks, things are pretty good now with maybe 4G was pretty bad. LTE is much better. A lot of people on mobile devices are even on Wi-Fi now. On, on, you know, it's pretty ubiquitous. So it's not as big a concern as it used to be back with 4G and LG. Um, but every remote lookup is going to require network latency. And that uh, is also going to require at least one DNS lookup. So where am I going to get my packets? i got to talk TCP. Give me the IP address. Away we go. Um, and then generating the remote resource is going to have some payload, right? That relies on the backend system, the web servers, the local web server disk, the storage itself, the database, getting messages out of a message machine, JSON out of a MongoDB, uh, you know, other telemetry that's streaming. If you've got WebSockets moving stuff, 
you, whenever you make a round trip request, it, it, you got to think about what's happening on the server. Is that actually hitting a database? Is that hitting a messaging source? Is it hitting static images or content somewhere? There's some implication on the server. Open up the socket, open up a thread, process the request, uh, chew up memory, consume memory, release the memory, process, maybe do calculations, whatever. So anytime you make a round trip, not only are you guaranteed to have network traffic on something simple like an image, a static resource. Worst case scenario, it's like a single ping that results in like four, an N plus one, like 4,000 hits to a database and, and distributed everything. So that's why they you know, generally tell people in the browser world, if you can make fewer requests, that's a good thing. Try to make fewer requests. So if you're optimizing stuff, see if you can load more content in a single round trip. So if I have 15 JavaScript files, Let's put them into one JavaScript file. And then I make one round trip. The payload is bigger, but I only have to do one DNS lookup and I only get one payload. I only have to open up one connection, one SSL handshake, uh, open it, get the work, terminate it. Um, and so you might actually reduce the remote resources required to render whatever you're trying to do. Um, and this is again where HTTP2 uh, will help you do this, or HTTP2 and 3 have optimizations within parallelism so that you can get stuff in parallel remotely and that's a really, really good thing. Um, so in a way, more is less. Um, if you can do, or less is more. Wait, that's what the sign is there. Less equals more. Um, that's, the, that's what that image is for. Um, oh, speaking of making round trips, let's talk about a content distribution network, which is the single biggest thing that we say in most of the news of damn stores, stories. Do, you're, you're not using a CDN. So if you have to make a round trip, if there's no way I actually have to go get this data set from the database, um, well, maybe that data set hasn't changed in two days. And maybe that image hasn't changed or the logo hasn't changed. So maybe I only need to go halfway. I think there was a Kenny Loggins song back in the 80s around that, which was Meet Me Halfway Across the Sky. It was from uh, probably uh, Top Gun. I think it's stop. It's the wrong movie. It's not. Uh, it's not Back to the Future. But meet me halfway uh, to the web server would be going to the CDN. So the content doesn't have to live on the web server that you're running. It can live in a network cache. It reduces the load on the actual origin server, uh, and you manage the network cache similar to the expires headers in the browser. It has a time to live, how long it, it, before it has to refresh, and a lot of the API vendors now, open source or otherwise. Uh, if you roll your own, they have like a full program, programmatic API, so you can actually automate the management of content living in the CDN. And you can put anything you want in the CDN. You can put images, you can put videos, basically anything that seems like a file uh, in one way, shape, or form. A stream, you can sort of spool stuff up and you can stream through a CDN, but you know they're sort of spooling in and first in and first out, first in, last out kind of thing. Um, the biggest thing I'd say for CDN when you're doing this is if you're pre-distributing large static content. So you have an event, let a point load event in the future, you want to preload that stuff into the CDN. But for the most part, this is a no-brainer uh, for a lot of static content on a website. Just click the box, turn on the CDN, and see what happens. Um, that'll be good. Um, so making other requests um, using file compression. Why should I use file compression? Well. Making anything smaller means you're going to reduce network transfer time. And that is, that is by and large, the number one benefit. I, why would I move a gigabyte across a network if I can move 500 meg? If I, why would I move a, a one meg image, huge, when I could use, move 500K? Why would I move 250K when I could move 25K? So depending on the type of, of image or resource, you can make these things really, really small. Um, just as an aside, if anyone has ever tried to compress Load Runner with raw results, it goes from being enormously huge, uh, but there's a lot of repeated text that gets down to really, really small. Um, the most common um, uh, uh, algorithms to use out there, the tools to use is GZIP, but there's also another one called Brotilli, which is, has some really cool advantages. You could check out Brotilli. Um, and the two things I'd say to keep in mind are CPU and the time it takes. So if you have to compress something, if it doesn't live natively compressed on the server, you need to enable compression on the server and it has to compress it on the fly. Uh, and then maybe you cache the compressed version in, the, in a CDN, that's a cool idea. But remember, it takes CPU to decompress that 
that resource on the client. On the browser, if it receives an image that's compressed, it's going to choose some PPU to decompress it, which if it's an SVG might be nice because you don't have a lot of pixels to decompress. Um, but if you've got other Rasta type images, uh, roster type images, then those would be harder to do. And of course it takes time. So if you're waiting for a page to load into the browser, you have to compress it on the server and that takes time and you have to decompress it on the client. So it's not just good for transfer time, but keep in mind, if you put compression on a lot of stuff, on a mobile device, you could chew through the battery pretty quick. Um, the other one is minifying your code. Minifying is such a strange, I'm a mini me. It's the, it's the mini, what are the minions? My minion version of the code. Um, and the, the sentence that basically when I look at all the minifying solutions out there, the, the main phrase is, why are you sending all that white space? Um, and if you've ever looked at an example, you're basically just removing all of the white space characters, the non-blank anything in, uh, in a given piece of code. You might not do this with HTML layouts where you want to keep spacing, like in the copy, text copy. Um, and But with code where it's just logic being executed, like JavaScript uh, or even CSS, you can make that code to be really small. Um, and you're pre-parsing the code. This is what's kind of cool. In development and QA, you might keep all the comments in there and you may, uh, you may have all the white space in there for debugging or whatever. But when you push it into production, minify it because uh, it reduces the transfer time and the bandwidth because it makes the file smaller. You're not moving emptiness. Um, you're removing the superfluous characters. Most of the end users aren't ever going to read your code, hopefully. Uh, hackers might, uh, but your dentist won't, uh, which is fine. Um, and most everyone, <laughs> tester, users, developer, nobody ever reads the comments, right? Why do you have comments in there? Any? I'm just kidding. Uh, so most people are not going to read the comments, and so you can pull a lot of that stuff out to have a very, very small, it just saves on size. Um, you'll see this working a lot on CSS and JavaScript and, of course, straight up HTML or other code. Um, but it's good for you to always have both minified and non-minified versions available. So if you are doing debugging and you want to see comments and you want to see white space for code readability, uh, you want to be able to do that. Um, as we come towards the end here, uh, I found two of these last rules. Uh, these were really interesting about 404s and 301s, and I, I uh, will call out to James Pulley, who talks a lot on News of the Damned about caching 404s. So he does a lot of work with log analysis through log parser or through some of the other work he's built and uh, invented. So he's really looking at you know optimizations in the log exhaust or web server exhaust. And for 404s, if you have a custom 404 message, wow, that should be cached somewhere in a CDN. Actually, the, the native 404 message, cache that in the CDN. There's lots of ways to put, you know, sort of expires headers and things, uh, tags on 404s. So the real question is, if, if I already know that that resource is not there, that's a bug. Like, why am I making the round trip when there's nothing there, right? It's like in Star Wars, they show up out of light speed and like, whoops, no Alderaan, it's gone. Uh, it's fast, 404s don't have content, they're really fast, but if, on uh, again, don't block the DOM, it blocks a connection. It still has to make a round trip. So it's gonna block a connection. It's still gonna hit the server, meaning you still have to open a socket, probably assign it a thread, only to show up and say, oh, there's no Alderaan, there's nothing there, here's a 404. So consider caching your custom 404s, and of course, do good testing, and remove all 404s from production. There's no reason for those bugs. Treat them as very, maybe low criticality, but fix, clean up all those bugs because it can really chew up a lot of a lot of issues. Um, 30301 redirects are slightly different, different than the 302. A 301 is more like uh, you go to the web server and the web, web server says, hey, didn't you know that that thing is not here? You need to go over there to that other place. So you made a round trip only to find out that you didn't need to come here in the first place. Oh, wait a minute, this is, there's a Monty Python skit, which is like, oh, this is being hit on the head lessons in here. You, need, you want an argument, that's down the hall on the left. Um, so you're, play, you're paying twice in a round trip just to get one resource. Again, that's a bug. If you know that other resource is in this other place, then either script it dynamically so you only make one call to the correct place, but 301s are kind of a, it's, it's just lazy, right? So it might be fast, Right, 301 is pretty fast, but again, it's going to block a connection and it's going to, you know, chew, she'll hit the server. 
Um, and again, you can do a cache header that says, don't, don't ask me again on this 301 for another two days or for another month. So consider using some cache headers to minimize repeated 301s uh, in production. That would be really good. Uh, again, that's going to hit that stuff. Now, uh, Henrik, you're still with me, right? You didn't fall asleep. He's there. I hope he's there. I don't know. He's my. He's there. I hear him. Are you snoring? <laughs> yeah, I was just sleeping. <laughs> All right. So, uh, for you know, keeping it real for the Neo Load world in Neotis, considering the last two items that these guys had put on their list of web performance rules, and guess what? Number 15, they just say infrastructure. They don't even tell you what you should do with infrastructure. It's just like, oh yeah, for web performance, Leandro, you gotta do some of that, uh, some of that infrastructure stuff, yeah. whatever that is. I, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a web designer, whatever the servers. And then of course, number 16, oh yeah, that uh, database, yeah, I don't, I don't know how it works. Just, you need to do some query tuning or something. Well, of course, like we never stopped doing load testing. We never stopped having the backend systems. Um, so I guess we st we're still relevant. We, we're not uh, completely uh, out, of, out to lunch. Uh, so that's, a, that's the saving grace for everything. For really good browser performance to work, you still need to have a really fast backend uh, that's optimized systemically to make the browser work. So finding and moving bottlenecks is good, optimizing data source queries, um, tuning the system from bottom up so you're using CPU and memory and network resources efficiently. Um, applying elastic scaling, I will say, would be good. Part of the infrastructure, everyone's going elastic using Kubernetes or using some of the inbuilt cloud elasticity, do that. And of course, monitor the hell out of everything because even the web performance folks, they live in single user browser render mode. And the minute you show them, here's the concurrency charts and the number of connections going up and the hits per second and real production graphs, uh, not just the single user, but the concurrency graphs, the load graphs, you know, their eyes get really big and they're like, oh, thank God we optimized our browser because the back end, it's 50% of the hits on the web server, 50% of the CPU, 50% of the database calls because we cached and optimized everything. And now that the browser behaves itself, your infrastructure and your data sources can be uh, much more optimally uh, saving, saving stuff. And that's all I have for the behind the scenes uh, web performance, Henrik. That's uh, thank you very much for joining me. Um, and I'm I'm very honored to be sort of the anchor bringing home the Neotis pack. Uh, this is, this is <laughs> because I have to uh, find out where that is. We're going back over here. I can stop sharing, right? Yeah, I can stop sharing. Uh, one thing. Uh, you do mention the tools, but uh, I think, and I, I asked the, the same question to Federico Toledo because he mentioned about uh, doing some yeah. web performance test. Yeah. What I have seen is most of the web performance tests, they are doing it with one single user. Makes sense. I want to figure out how it's loaded on the browser. But again, uh, from my perspective, I am building a web app with a lot of JavaScript, a lot of uh, small JSON call here and there, to, uh, so I can get some data, JavaScript will parse the data, and then and, and then dissipate on the browser. And I think doing a web performance one user without any noise, without anything happening in the background, I don't know if it's really efficient. So I was wondering if it doesn't make sense to Combine, say, hey guys, you know, you, you know, there's going to be some concurrent concurrent users. Why don't we do combine some small load and then we do the white or whatever the test to make sure that if there are concurrency, that for example, a JavaScript that try to get the this JSON content, but the JSON content doesn't respond because it's super slow on the back end, and then what happens naturally on the JavaScript layer, it's been stuck. And, and yeah. sometimes the web developer are pretty smart and they handle the exception and it doesn't make some impact really up. so the user and user don't see it much, but sometimes they forgot about it. Yeah. Uh, video wise, you're looking at Leandro's camera, by the way. You want to change the blue jean. That's, that's not Mark Tomlinson and it doesn't even look like me because Leandro doesn't have blue hair. You're trying to look like a senior performer. Oh, yeah. wait a minute. There you go. Oh, I can hear myself now. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, you look a little, uh, Senor. You look a little. Um, Senor Mark. So if you want to re-examine the the video feed there, Henrik. Uh, but back to your question, there's two two things on the thought, Henrik, for this. One is that I tried to separate sort of browser client only web optimization into the first few ones I went through. I think there were like six or eight of them. And then the rest of them were really sim system wide kind of changes. Um, a lot of times if you do web performance, let's say CSS at the top, JavaScript at the bottom, um, if you run that with or without load, it's more like static analysis. Like it has almost no yeah. bearing whether the back end is bad. I mean, sure, maybe the JavaScript is, the, the resource is slow. To your point, I think about the JSON. Let's say the JSON request is, that's made from an X HTML request from, the, from a JavaScript execution on the client. Um, and let's say that that is slow um, and the JSON payload is required for the functionality of the page. So concurrent latency, uh, latency caused by concurrency on a data source request actually impairs functionality on the client, then you're absolutely right. Um, that's where we wanna do functionality testing under load. Thank you, Eric Pregler, um, for, in, for inventing that. And uh, I think look, doing static analysis it, maybe we need a new rule there, Henrik, that says here are certain types of the the page when we do static analysis and the rule is says if you have functionality dependent content that is coming from a data source, not just something you can cache like a static image or something like something that doesn't change. If it's a dynamic data coming back to the client, um, maybe we have to find a way to flag that that says this is one that's vulnerable to latency under concurrency. And maybe that's a, that's maybe we have a whole new rule there that gives a heads up to a web developer that it's like, hey, don't just assume this little JSON thing's gonna be fast. This, this could get slow in the real world. Yeah. And otherwise, yeah. also some other thing is, uh, I mean, you've been working with Shinra, so I, I remember the priest of Shinra was using that image, uh, saying that uh, people is making, instead of, uh, making a huge uh, old-fashioned HTTP uh, websites where you download a big stuff and then you start rendering, people yeah. are doing a lot of uh, chat chessness. So uh, you can have a lot of uh, Ajax calling back and forth. So, uh, uh, mm -hmm. so they, they, I remember that the guys from Shudra say, uh, you know, modern apps are similar to, uh, uh, old apps are similar to me discussing with my friends, say, hey, hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, let, let's have a drink. Okay. And now, yeah. if my, my wife has the same thing with her, her friend, suddenly there is more conversation in the middle. So it, it's more chattiness. And at yeah. this point, the moment you have a lot of Ajax call, it's great. You download less, you have less data to you exchange in the browser, it's great. But in TCP, you bring up the latency in every communication. So if you're using one for one, then, then the impact of uh, the latency and, the, and uh, all the jitter and so on will be huge for the browser. Um, yeah. And um, and um, for HTTP2, yeah, HTTP2, I think it's going to be the same. But uh, yeah, I it, think it, definitely with HTTP2, like I was saying, parallelism is one of the biggest pieces. There was another gotcha in HTTP2, and it may be similar in HTTP3. Uh, and Scott may have mentioned this was the idea that you have a lot of server side processing that can happen, and there's still server side JavaScript uh, in the world that's been around for ten years or more. Um, and of course, the concept of loading a script from the browser to the server and have the server run it or it lives on the server, that's a common thing. But the, the idea that you combine parallelism as well as server execution, uh, it's good because it minimizes the round trips, meaning you've got, hey, server, go do these 18 things for me and then just give me one reply with what I want. Uh, and that, that can be a really, really good optimization. And then combine that with parallelism you could have like four of those requests fired off to four different servers and they're all doing multiple things and the browser is chewing less and less work. Uh, and of course, if we make the server side scalable, elastic, now we can take those four things each, that's a total of 16 things. And let's say maybe we scale that out to 16 different containers. Right. Yeah, and so now we have elasticity in the web or, or app tiers because a single client 
is not elastic in, in and of itself, right? You can't say, oh, I'm going to spin up another browser to do these. You can't do that. So the idea of parallelism as well as from HTTP2 being able to do server side execution of things to get one reply, uh, I think we're going to see that change quite a bit. But again, yeah, but so, server... so, so maybe yeah. that uh, all those web performance tools need to utilize also one emulation or network virtualization to yeah. simulate saying that, hey, hey, by the way, uh, it's great, your Jasper is awesome, but uh, our customer is going to use uh, uh, the app in the train, you know, so they're going to have some packet loss or they're yep. going to have some more latency. And, and are you sure that the JavaScript that you have built here is not going to be a nightmare for those customers? Yeah, you're right. Uh, also, in I know in Firefox, I think in some of the other ones, you can change the form factor for the web browser. And if you dig in the developer tools within the browser, you can change the form factor that you're running and getting the rules and stuff for. I think some of them at Firefox for sure has a has a latency. You can you can actually throttle it. If not, of course, you can always look at Fiddler or Charles Proxy or some of the other uh, WAN emulation tools that run locally. But I think a couple of the browser dev tools do have some sort of uh, at least time, timing based, not maybe not a whole queuing mechanism, but a, a timing delay. Uh, packet by packet when when it does that. So there's some throttling. Um, one of the things we did in the workshop yesterday uh, with Leandro is the, at the very end, we kind of peeled away the developer tools. Uh, I was in Chrome. Well, the uh, options that I provided. Yeah, you and you, yeah, you can be simple. You can look at a timeline. You can look at a waterfall chart. You know, it's fairly straightforward. And then you can go even deeper, right? So you can get into every component within the browser architecture and see where the time is spent which is full on profiling stuff. Uh, most of the performance folks I know, even from a de web developer standpoint, don't go there very often. Um, no but, uh, but it's there for free. Even your grandmother can open the dev tools and start you know, digging around in there. But I remember, uh, you remember that Dan Trace had this, uh, well, I don't know if they told it, Ajax Appmon, I, uh, they had this, this free Dan Trace. Yeah, no, uh, it, uh, it was the, eight, Ajax something or other, Ajax add in, yeah. Ajax toolkit, yeah. Uh, and he was able to drill down. It, it was, was a free cool. download, and that, that was the yeah. download thing you'd send to Andy, and, and Andy was the you know free trial thing. Yeah, and Andy, yeah, in fact, that's, uh, now that's so built in. And now what is, what uh, just uh, from a Neota standpoint, I mean, you guys have some stuff built in on the client side, both in Neoload, but isn't there some things in the functional side for that you do this as well? We are working on something. But we don't have, a, we, at the moment, we, we have a pure practical approach and the way we, we don't simulate the browser. So we are, at the moment, we are relying on Selenium. But, uh, we are exploring yeah. a technology at the moment. Yeah, um, but not necessarily in Neoload, in the other Neotis functional testing tools that, that no, we just, automate the browser. I think you, I mean, yeah. you can open up the dev tools and you can interact with the browser dev tools as well. You can, like the APIs, you could pull right out of, out of Firefox or Chrome. Um, in almost almost any of the automation tools you can do, you could pull the HAR file. That's the HTTP yeah. archive record. You could pull the HAR file out. You could render a waterfall, log that with the test results at the end of each page. So there's some really cool functional testing automation things you can do with this WebPerf information and compare it, build over build, test run over test run, and then you know if things change over time. Well, we like to graph things. You know, does the did you last week we all got A's on all of the grading in Yslow, and on Tuesday something happened, and now we're all getting F's. Uh, and you know that that can happen from you know looking at performance for that, like you say, Henrik, that single user sampling for static analysis, but then maybe that static analysis changes day over day over day if you're building every day, uh, and that that trend is a performance trend. We, we were at A's, then we were at A minus, now we're at B's, then we're at C's, or you know, certain rules start to degrade. Uh, even though it's a single user sampling, you could still track that, you know, hey, we're, we're, somebody showed up and we're doing something wrong here, even in development. And this but is still, yeah. uh, advantages that even for scripting, I have, now that you mentioned the HAR file, mm -hmm. I have used them, uh, I used the process a couple of times to generate a hard file for each one of those runs. And I think they are stored in JSON format. 
Yeah, they companies. are. Yeah. And just by doing a comparison, you can even help your automation for load testing. Like, here's the difference. Here's why changing and it's being marked. Yeah. And you can use those hard facts, as you mentioned, to give a benchmark and see what is new, what has been changed. Yeah. yeah. And it's great as well. Uh, I wanted to add that you mentioned <laughs> that I shouldn't uh, deny this uh, stepchild that uh, is very important to pay attention to. The red, the red-headed stepchildren. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm definitely gonna uh, start taking more seriously. Yeah. Uh, give the allowance and everything <laughs> that is uh, due. But another um, thing that you mentioned that I think it's very important. You sometimes, and the business don't tell you when you're trying to automate and create a scenario or something mm -hmm. for your load test, and the, the customer will only tell you, hey, I, I only create uh, 10 invoices per hour. Yeah. And you're like, no, I'm seeing 10 million, 10 billion. And, and that match to what the front end, the customer, the right. JavaScript, and all the, those, those JSONs are generating those multiple round trips that are not necessary, yeah. or for some reason they are just going back and forth, back and forth, several Reddit X, circular Reddit X, I have seen that as well. Yeah. And you're like, why is that happening? And if you just paid attention to those, you would basically notice that they are generating, they are, were poorly coded in the front end, right? or they are doing several of those unnecessary that's calls right. and not bringing everything at once. That's, I think that's a big uh, piece to uh, yeah. performance. Not only on the server side. Yeah. And I'm ashamed to just to have been paying attention to the server. <laughs> it's all right, you know. The first the, key that I have the, fir I the first step is admitting that you that you yeah, have ignored yeah. it and then we can go on from there. I have a problem. My name is Lando Melendez, thank you. And uh... <laughs> and I I do not do web performance, yeah. Exactly. So Henrik, uh, did, were there any other questions or uh are, have we come I think, to the uh, end no, of the that, path? That, yeah, I think we uh, didn't have much more questions. I just have more notes, but uh, I think uh, you covered everything. Uh, so yeah. uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, no, stop. Sorry. Thanks, Leandro Melendez, for your your second session. <laughs> yeah, the second, yeah, he got to be the the visual of the second session. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm totally happy. And congratulations on staying up yet again, 24 hours straight for the pack virtual. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. Uh, real men stuff. <laughs> so let me do a small, uh, small wrap up, and we can uh, officially stop this conference. Uh, so I have one slide, just one slide. Uh, so, uh, uh, all right. So just to give you uh, uh, the overview of what happened during this. Uh, this uh, journey, uh, we had several stops during the day. Uh, we covered uh, five different locations. Uh, so we started this morning at 5 a.m. We uh, reached out to New Zealand uh, and we had uh, three really good present presentations. Let's be honest. So Stephen was, was the first speaker and uh, he talked about uh, uh, pipeline and yeah, utilizing oh. J meter and uh, taking advantage of Tableau and so on. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, so it was a really good session. Go uh, we'll pack it up. Uh, uh, let me just unmute yourself, guys. Uh, uh, and then after that, we uh, we had uh, Duvalia Parna uh, that uh, um, in, that that made a, a presentation related to the, the topics that was presented last year by Dane or by uh, Stephen about uh, the usage of raw data and, and Tableau, and she's mentioned that Tableau could be expensive, so she figured another alternative called R Studio. That's pretty interesting. So I, I didn't heard about it. So if you didn't have heard about R Studio, I, I may recommend to uh, listen to the recordings of Azure. Otherwise, Philip Webb presented uh, is uh, a, a new open source project called Mark 5.9, combining JMeter. Um, Combining uh, Selenium and, uh, and Jenkins, uh, there's a lot of interesting takeaway from from that session. Then we went back to India, Central Asia, with uh, three other speakers. So uh, Ruben talked about observability, um, 
what uh, what type of source we should pick, what are the granularity of the metrics, uh, everything that, that allows you to collect the proper metrics and make a decision. And last, after that, we had Emma that was talking about uh, uh, um, using machine learning and performance testing, and moreover than performance testing, uh, doing performance modeling. So some examples comparing uh, production data with uh, testing and, and, and applying the right algorithm. Uh, then we had uh, Emma, Yuma, and uh, Harry uh, who made a presentation uh, about the performance testing ISAP. Pretty interesting. Uh, she they, uh, highlighted the challenges. Uh, what you should consider, what should we monitor? So pretty, pretty interesting topic, especially if you are testing in the ACB system. Uh, we reached out to the uh, third locations, uh, which was MEA, so biggest, uh, biggest uh, location of that conference today. So seven speakers with uh, Stefano uh, from Akamas uh, shared the results that uh, they have been able to do some benchmark on, on tuning and optimizing. Um, a system based on Amazon, so the, their solution was able to figure out which instances uh, you should pick to have good performance and also a cost reduction. So pretty interesting uh, the, to see the results of the of the benchmark. Um, Bruno, would you uh, make some uh, talk about again automation? Uh, and he he uh, he explained it through the project that he has at the moment with the French. Are a car, a French car manufacturer, so pretty interesting. Um, Rob Davies, that was uh, with us at the Whopper, uh, presented another approach of building a pipeline using uh, AWS Fargate and JMeter, um, and he made a, a smooth transition with J, uh, Stain because the, he wanted to implement a Stain's framework. So Stain talked about his framework called Robotic Analytic Framework, so uh, based on scoring and raw data and Tableau. Uh, we had uh, Christoph Neumeuler, that, uh, that it's, is an architect from Dynatrace, who presented uh, an oil, also an open source project from Dynatrace uh, called, um, uh, that helps you to do some uh, dump, uh, memory dump analysis. So uh, how to automate it, how you can uh, speed up those uh, type of uh, analysis. Uh, and last we had uh, Ian van Berg, that did, uh, not, not class, but uh, Ian van Berg did a presentation on how to build efficient scripts. I think that you should consider uh, when you go to protocol uh, scripting or uh, when you should go for pure browser-based approach. Uh, and the last speaker of the region was uh, Jurek van Gallen that uh, presented um, the how to automate and build pipelines. So uh, he made some, uh, some, some list of uh, things you should consider, things that need to be uh, applied when you start automating. Uh, and then he made a small example uh, utilizing Gatling and, and Grafana. So really a pretty, pretty lot of great takeaways from from your uh, sessions. Then we went to US East, where we had three speakers. SK started with uh, the performance trends. Uh, so he uh, mentioned uh, the the project that this is working for uh, a big uh, e-commerce American web e-commerce website. Um, so uh, the architecture based on Kubernetes and cloud native architecture, how you can uh, automate everything. And he was going to implement as well machine learning to be able to detect uh, regressions and, and predict things that through the machine learning. Uh, Alex uh, Scott, uh, we talked about it a few minutes ago. He made this presentation on the HTTP3 protocol. So he made a benchmark comparing HTTP 1.1, HTTP 2, and HTTP 3. With or less, with or no latency. So he shared his uh, his observation. Even if it's early stage of the quick protocol, uh, there was a nice takeaway of that. I think we need to rebench it once we have a, a more stable version of the quick protocol. The last speaker of the region uh, of US East was Alexander Podolko, who reminded the importance of performance modeling. So, um, for those not familiar with performance modeling, he made a lot of references, books, or blogs that you should. Read and mathematic rules that you should know or you maybe forgot. Uh, so it's it's pretty good to have uh, him reminding those rules. And the last location, uh, so US West, we had uh, Federico Poledo who uh, started the, uh, the zone. So he also uh, uh, explained how to 
uh, automate uh, perform uh, in, in a continuous delivery model. Uh, the uh, test simple uh, use uh, not use a J meter uh, like a normal J meter, but Taurus it would be easier. Uh, making the the fact that when you test earlier, you don't test the same thing than you when you go to test the uh, assemble application. Also make the focus on what performance to measure the user experience. Uh, followed by uh, uh, we had Antoine made a topic about blockchain testing. So uh, he reminded us the different type of tests that we can have in blockchain, things that we can measure the challenge uh, and the different frameworks that are in the market. And the two last speakers are friend from Perfight, uh, Leandro Melendez. Uh, so uh, he uh, shared a nice story about uh, the Pinto, the car, to highlight the importance of measuring the cost and the, the, the uh, rule of the 80-20, like the right scenarios to avoid the uh, spending of cost just to automate. So be smart. Don't automate any, uh, anything uh, without asking the right questions. And last, Mark Pinson had the pleasure to um, explain the web performance behind the scenes, all the things you should consider. And maybe uh, so uh, as a performance engineer, we're not super familiar with that, but uh, I think it was a pretty awesome, awesome session. So uh, I'd like to thank all the PAC members that were connected today. So thanks. Uh, as I can see that SK is still there, so I'm going to enable everyone before we finish this, this conference. Um, so it was a real pleasure to be with you guys during 24 hours. Almost 10 minutes left, and we have reached 24 hours. So uh, I think we're going to take uh, our DeLorean and uh, reach out back home. Uh, so it was a pretty intense event. Uh, and I think, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, so we, we put a lot of effort this year on this one. Hope uh, you enjoyed it. And uh, stay tuned because soon there will be the next physical pack happening beginning of next year. All right. Thank you again for everyone. Thank for your motivation, your involvement. Thanks for all the attendees that have been staying connected during the entire day. And I will say see you next year for another 24 hours. Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs> Adios. Au revoir. Adios. Au revoir.